since. All right, folks, we're back. I'm your host, BKP. We always want to start out by thanking Georgia Cancer Specialist Northside Hospital Cancer Center for Ask the Doc with Dr. William Whaley and our good friend, the TV test pattern, Raymond <laughs> Tidman. All right. So is just, that wrong? No, no. Was no. that wrong? No. no but but if you do you, see squiggling lines that are going this way, go see your ophthalmologist. You, I was reading. I was reading yesterday. Doctor, the respected doctor. <laughs> I was reading Sorry. yesterday that Al Sharpton's suits cost more than most of the TV anchors' cars. And I would like to say that Ray Tidman's shirt cost more than most of the people around here's pickup trucks did. Not, hey. it's, not, it, it's not in the same category as Al Sharpton's suits, but it's in a category for a Blue Ridge that's similar. So you're telling but, me he paid for that? No, no, no. no, 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 he no. Did listen, listen. My, uh, my he deal, doesn't pay for that. My deal does. with my relationship is that I am not to know how much these things cost because not I would know. freak out. Yeah, right. he's not. He Put them in the closet yeah. and don't say No, no, no. He's, he's supposed to wear them and he does wear them. And yeah. I will say I got a whole closet full of Italian suits and stuff I haven't put on in 10, what, I've been up here 27 years? I've been in the closet 27 years. I ain't worn one. I did wear one to a funeral in Atlanta about a year ago. You do have some jackets down there on the hanger that's caught my eye. I, I do afraid. have some jackets that are <laughs> on the hanger that caught, they caught my eye. Time well, now, the other thing we talk about is the that's tie, right. either the tie or the weather. So we're talking about the weather. We were three and a half inches short on rain 10 days ago. We are 1.3 inches short on rain now, and it's going to rain 95% today, 40, 30. So by the end of this, end of this, this month, I think we're going to be within a half an inch of the average. Now, we were 20 inches over in the previous two years and 20 inches below in the two years before that, and that's all due to global warming. Now, when you add it up, what does it turn out to be? Ray, you just heard those numbers. We turn out to be within one inch over five years of our annual rainfall. Now, that's pretty darn close, and you can't say it changed much. In one year, two years, we were 20 inches behind in two years. Two years, we were 20 inches over in two years, and this year, we're going to be about a half inch off. Now, I can't tell but you. But you know, we have a. We have, every time it rains or, or doesn't rain, they blame it on global warming. That's right. Well, we've had a millennial of, of people who have feathers in their hair and wear funny shoes and dance around fires that, you know, that make it rain or not rain. So I, I don't think that's the, anything you're saying there's new. But I do want to share this story with you. This uh, Indian tribe, uh, the old chief passed away. And as was their custom, the oldest boy became the new chief first winter was coming along and, and the tribe came to him and he said well uh, how, how much wood should we put put up for the winter this this year and he said well just go go out and gather the usual amount after saying that he ran into town you know because he's educated now and he called up the national weather service and he said well listen what, what's the forecast this year for the winter and they said well it looks like a normal winter he goes okay good so he goes back and next week the tribe comes back and he says well okay well, what do you think have we got enough wood here and he looks at it and he goes uh, maybe go let's go get a little bit more so they go off into the woods and he runs back into town calls the weather service and and uh, they say he said what, what what's the winter looking like have you guys adjusted your forecast or not and they said yeah well maybe a little bit colder than usual anyway i'll cut this story short this goes back and forth for several weeks and then, then finally um, the tribe comes back and says look we've got more wood than we've ever gathered in our life are you sure this is enough wood and he goes well hold on a minute let me just I'll, I'll get back to you tomorrow so he runs back into town and calls up the weather service and he says okay what's the deal you guys keep evolving your story here well how much how bad is this winter going to be and they said well hell we don't know the indians are gathering a lot of firewood <laughs> Okay, we told that joke two years ago, but those of you who are new on here don't know that don't know don't know about it. All right. So the Indian, we're supposed to be asking. Questions. We've been watching those Indians gather fire. This has got to be a bad winter That's coming. It. Oh, yeah. God. oh, you don't remember that okay, two years uh, ago? You yeah, had Alzheimer's. All right. yeah. You stay, you stay right over there for a minute, okay? We'll let you know when we're bringing you back. Speaking of Alzheimer's, <laughs> do you know what the last thing an Irishman with Alzheimer's forgets? A grudge. <laughs> Okay, our first question. <laughs> well, I'm going to say something. We were, Ray was saying he had a patient this week who said, I saw you on the TV. Uh, the first patient, the first question we have today, interestingly enough, comes from Chicago. I paid attention to where it came from, just for your interest. My son is 60 years old. Hmm. 
with three biopsies out of 12 with prostate cancer. Gleason four plus three. Now, that's, remember that four plus three, not three plus four. And each was 20 to 50% involved. His urologist recommended surgery and his PCP asked him if he wanted to see a medical oncologist or a radiation therapist. Your suggestions, please. Well, first of all, the guy did the right thing, and he went and asked his primary care doc, surgeon wants to take out my prostate, what should I do? We know that he's 60 years old, and the question is being asked by his father. So his father is at least uh, yeah he's 80, probably 80 or 90, 90 yeah. so we the got, kid got some pretty good genetics right mm -hmm. okay put up the first one this is historical picture and we showed this about six months ago this is prostate cancer then and now and i'll be quick about it but the top of this is what the historical prostate cancer the way ray and i were trained presented when a guy had a fracture in his back or he was unable to urinate and he had advanced disease. Now, at the bottom half, he's getting diagnosed because his PCP did a PSA and it was elevated. And therefore, when he was biopsied, generally, he had low volume disease. Now, bring that down. Let me put an, an emphasis on that. When I came out of training in the 80s, Prostate, I had a practice with tons of prostate cancer of men dying of very painful metastatic bone lesions that the prostate cancer was killing them. Yeah. And now I have almost no one die of prostate cancer. They, die, they may have prostate cancer, and but they die of something else. That's like dying with COVID from yeah. something else, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. All right, so we're going to go, the next algorithm here is kind of lengthy here, but say this is decision making with with the idea of an elevated PSA and a suspected diagnosis of prostate cancer. And it starts out with, is a biopsy indicated? And then after the biopsy is indicated, is treatment indicated? And it's not quite very often that we make a malignant diagnosis and then say, do we, should we treat it or not? Well, chronic lymphocytic leukemia and indolent lymphomas is watch and wait, right? Mm -hmm. So anyhow, the, very, the next thing says, determine the risk stratification. Pull that down. This man says right off the bat that only three of 12 biopsies were involved at 30 to 50% of the biopsy. So if you think, think each biopsy has got a number of 100, 12 were done, that's 1,200 marks of cancer, excuse me, marks of prostate of which somewhere between 70 and 150 are malignant. So at the very worst, this is sort of like 10% or 7.5% of the gland being involved with cancer. So even though you've got cancer, it's a tiny piece. And remember, the prostate's about the size of a walnut or an almond or a plum or something. Okay. We go to the next one, which is the staging. And this prostate cancer, if you look at the T1A or the T1B, the first thing says, you got it up there, right? Finding in less than 5% of the tissue, finding in 5% of less of the tissue, tissue can find in one lobe, blah, blah, blah. So this guy has got an early sized tumor. It's all still in the T1 group, isn't it? All right, pull that one down. Now, the most important thing in his, we're making the assumption that, this, that the scans didn't show any lymph nodes. I think if they did, then the, the daddy would have known it. But Bill, aside from the staging, what about his age? He's, he's a, young. He's a little bit young, yeah. All right, so let's go to the next one. Stage starts leaping up immediately. Don't forget, if he's young, I'm young. Okay. I just want to clear All right, that. okay, and his daddy is still alive. That's an important thing. And apparently in good health. And doesn't have prostate cancer, he would have told us. Well, soon it, these are all the same size tumor on this mm -hmm. side, but over here where it says grade group, and you go to two, it jumps the stage by a whole heap. Well, 
you remember the Gleason score? You can pull that down. I'll That's some of the best charts. Those are easy charts. The, the, no, those You're are good charts. Yeah, those are. All right. So the Gleason score, remember I said it was four plus three. Underneath the microscope, they look at, and we did this about six months ago. You remember, and I showed some pictures. The closer it looks to like normal prostate cancer, the lower the number. So the first number is the number of what, how far does it vary from normal looking prostate cancer to wild cancer you can't hardly tell the difference of. Under the microscope. Under the microscope. And the highest number is five. So the highest number you could have would be five plus five. Well, if the first number is what is the majority of the biopsy? And the second number is if there is more, if there's a, if any di difference, what is it? So if the whole thing is, is four, that'd be eight. But the, the biggest part's four, the smallest part's three, that makes the number seven. And that puts it at a significantly higher risk than this six. My prostate cancer that I have mentioned many times before is being treated by observation. It's now 10 years, hadn't done anything, and mine's three plus three. This guy cannot, I will show you in a minute why that's not a good idea for this guy. And I was, what, uh, 70 when mine was diagnosed. Okay, we're going to the next one. Treatment algorithm by prognostic risk category. So this is what this is all about. The risk group is how many years does this guy have to live? So these are, like Ray says, older people, people who have five years, 10 years, 10 to 20, and greater than 20 years. I think this guy's got greater than 20 years to live. So even if he was in a very low risk group, all less than 20 years, if he was, he's not really in the very low risk group, he's in the He's in the moderate, low risk and low intermediate risk, but observation is a valid treatment if you've got a life expectancy of 10 years or less, even with this. Now, once you get to 20 years with my kind of cancer, and I surely hope I'm gonna live more than 20 years, active surveillance. You're going another 20? No, he's going for three digits. No, I was checking. Oh. I was wondering. Well, no, we're going now, Bill. We, we don't back up here. You're right. going for a three-digit lifespan. Yeah, I don't yeah. think so. From I don't think so. From the you anyway, just broke some news. I did. All right. So anyway, even if you got greater than 20 years, it says active surveillance. Preferred. Preferred. preferred yes. Preferred. Okay. Or then it gets into to radiation and surgery. So he, after 20 years, greater than 20 years, even with mine they would say, let the patient make the decision, but tell him active surveillance is still preferred. And that, that pr preferred is one of those things that Ray was just talking about, about value-based medicine and so forth. And preferred means that the side effects versus the benefit are kind of equal here. And you can, you, you, the chances you're going to die of prostate cancer aren't very good, but if you're the kind of guy that says, when in doubt, cut it out and get this cancer out of my body, either radiate it or, or go forward. Now, this, we're going to spend a little time on this. Title is? The Advantages of the Main Treatment Options for Early Prostate Cancer. Okay. That, the bottom is active surveillance. The top is external beam radiation therapy, which is totally non-invasive. So they don't do any, they don't stick any needles anywhere. You lie on a table Monday through Friday for five minutes for seven weeks and you get a, a, a dose of radiation. We'll go back into it in a minute. Then a higher dose of radiation, blah, blah, blah. The next one is, I'm not gonna make you pronounce it, but that says brachytherapy. Brachytherapy. You know that as seeds. Yes, yeah, okay. Or if you'd have just said the seeds, seeds because I know some people that have oh, gone through yeah, that therapy. Seeds. Or it can be radiation therapy with the kind of gamma knife thing. See, okay, you got that? External beam versus focused radiation. What's the next one? 
radical prost bro, Detect, take it out. radical prostatectomy. That's prostatectomy. Radical to, prostatectomy. In other words, cut it out. We're going to talk about that. And then the bottom one is active surveillance. Well, the the active surveillance its advantages is it immediately reduces over treatment. Yeah, it reduces it avoids -treat. all treatment related complications because you didn't do mm -hmm. anything and it has no effect on work or social activities and social activities is the nice way of saying sexual function or leaking bladder or something of that sort. So we're going to look at this kind of quick here. Here's the, the idea of a radical prostatectomy. You remember the prostate's about this big, about that big, sits down here at the base of the bladder. The urethra or the P-tube runs through the middle of it. And if you are going to take that whole thing out, you're going to have to remove about that much material. And you're go there's going to be a gap between the bladder and the P-tube that you're going to have to reconstruct. Now. Let's not leave these on the screen too long. But we pulled that one down already because we're getting ready to put one on. You don't want to leave it on the screen. It's a family-friendly show. You don't, you don't want it to. You don't want This is an educational show for adults. All right. <laughs> now, your kids have already gone to school. Now, I want to say that one, and I did this a few weeks ago, one of the greatest criticisms of medical oncology that occurs in the book, The Emperor of All Maladies, which and the, that the general public has about medical oncologists like me is that we underestimate or undersell the complications of our treatment. And that when we say you got an 80% chance of going into a remission with chopratuximab mm -hmm. and you can be cured and then your mom ends up in the hospital getting transfused and has no hair and has nausea, the family says, wow, is this really worth it? In other words, they, they say that they didn't, you know, you, your mama got saved right. and she had a lot of stuff going through it. So we are, we are accused of not being quite as, as fearful of what we do as we should be. Now, I want to show you this picture. Bill, which Bill, is, let me emphasize that. Yeah. We are rightfully accused. We are rightfully accused. Okay, I didn't say it's wrong. I said yeah. I'm guilty of yeah. it too. Yeah. This picture right here has been shown to my patient showing that here, they're going to make an incision and they're going to take out the hat there and, and it doesn't it's it's a cartoon isn't it pull that down it doesn't do, it doesn't tell you much you, you with me i'm with you all pull the way up the okay. next one that's what it actually looks like in terms of a picture pull it down in other words a bloody mess in other words that cartoon doesn't show you what the trauma to the perineum is Perineum is this region between your legs. And so when you get back to radical prostatectomy and we go into the different surgical techniques, that's one of three open surgical techniques. But nowadays, most of us remember that the surgery is being done by a robot. Now you're paying a surgeon who's driving the robot. So this is the picture of the ro got it? Of the patient while hooked to the trocars for the robot. Now if you count those, that's one, two, three, four, five, six. Six, six knife wounds. Six knife wounds in the abdomen. The operation cr creates the same thing here as the, the robot does. Pull that down now. But you don't see any gaping wound, do you? No. I'm going to tell you that many of my patients who are as healthy as Ray or as healthy as BKP who have the robot operation go home that night. Many of them will spend the night because they started at noon and they get finished late and they may have a bit of anesthesia, they might be a little bit nauseated, but they don't stay in the hospital for a week or anything. And that first guy you saw, he's not going to get out that night, right Ray? No, not at all. Okay. Now, so we'll just say quickly, robotic radical prostate, got the next one, has totally overpowered open surgery for local prostate cancer. And that shows the, ro the, the robot needle. Now, so that is sort of the gold standard of, quote, most curative treatment for early stage prostate cancer 
at this stage for somebody who's going to live 20 or more years, as this guy very well may. Put up the next one. This is what you do with radioactive seeding. This is the prostate. This is a needle. You go into the, to the uh, radiology suite, really, where they're under CT guidance. They can stick that needle a lot of times into the prostate. Now, you're anesthetized for that. And then they put these little seeds along yeah. the course of it, then pull the thing out. You can pull that down now. And each of those seeds is a radioactive little piece of metal, and that's going to release, release radioactivity, and those seeds will be there for the rest of your life. And the complication issues we're not going to go into, but you'll have some swelling and some discomfort and stuff. But that'll all be over with in six weeks or eight weeks. This next one that you're looking at is the high-intensity external beam radiotherapy. You've seen this many times before in stereotactic lungs we've showed you or brains. And if you look at all of the beautiful colors in physics, what they've done, I'm going to pull that one down, is they've taken this machine, and I can tell you this machine is very expensive. There's one of these in Blairsville and there's one of these in Canton. That's the two closest to where we are. But as you can see, that big machine rolls around. Pull that down now. So what they do is they take the patient, they put tattoos at various places on the pelvis. When they get in that box, they are sort of kind of clamped in there where they don't move so that today and next Friday, when they're in that machine, they're in that machine in exactly the same position down to the millimeter. Now some fancy young guy who went to Georgia Tech, and I hate to say this, excuse me, I'm proud to say this, these, these comp computations are actually made on the Georgia Tech campus. It doesn't make any difference whether you're in Blairsville or whether you're in, in, in Canton or anywhere else. Those guys that do all these calculations when they do these scans, this is all put in some kind of thing in here and goes down there on a, what, what do you call it, images and stuff. And these engineers down at Georgia Tech, they create this computer program so that that machine can be rotated around like this. Let's just say that you go in there uh, Monday through Friday for seven weeks is, is 35 times. That radiation is never going to be delivered at the same angle into that body in any of those 35 times. But the focus of it in the middle is going to be right on that prostate every time. So you can visualize how the other organs that get penetrated, like the, the colon and the bladder and everything else, are saved high-dose mm. radiation, and it's focused right in the middle. Okay. Now, Ray was talking about statistics and science and all-cause mortality about every other time we're in here. So this is what's called a Christmas tree plot. This is cancer-specific mortality, but there's two of these. I didn't send her the second one, which is all-cause mortality. But what this is then is taking anything, the size of the tumor, the Gleason score, whether the PSA is greater than lower than 20, all of those risk factors, and then putting radical prostatectomy against any of those radiation things, then the hazard ratio, 0 0.42, 0 0.61, blah, 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 means that that favors radical prostatectomy in hundreds of patients over the alternative treatment. The only one that favors radiation is people who have that disease that had already spread outside of the prostate. Pull that down. So wait, let me make a point here. You see that vertical line there. Every dot that's to the left of the vertical line favors that treatment. Yes. Anything to the right does and not. And there's favor. only one to the right, and yeah. that's people who've got disease that's outside the prostate. Right. So basically, a surgical procedure is not better than radiation if it's already spread to the lung. I mean, that's basically what the story is. So let's go back and answer the question. You didn't do that. 
I'm I've been here for 20 minutes. PCP asked him if he wanted to see a medical oncologist or radiation therapist. Now you're getting to my thoughts. I've been thinking about this. Go ahead. I believe that either choice would be fine. There are radiation therapists who specialize in radiation treatments. They're going to talk the radiation treatment to a hammer everything's a nail. So that surgeon mentioned surgery. The radiation therapist is going to try and sell radiation of some sort, but most of them are pretty honest about the difference in the long-term differences. And after he's seen both, if he's still confused and the PCP has told him his experience, the guy's been in practice as long as Ray has, got 150 or 200 patients that have prostate cancer, then yes, go see the medical oncologist. Because the medical oncologist does not have a role in the treatment of this guy right now. If it was Gleason 8, 4.4, the, the oncologist would start him on hormonal therapy immediately, regardless of whether he was going to get surgery or radiation. So he probably ought to see the medical oncologist anyway and talk about hormonal therapy in addition to. But the, he did the right thing by seeing the PCP. The PCP can send him to either, in my opinion. And then your son has to make the decision, since I believe he'll live greater than 20 years, about whether he wants to go through the radical prostatectomy or one of the other treatments, but I don't think your son's gonna die of prostate cancer if he's aggressively and appropriately treated now. So observation, in my opinion, probably would not be best for him because I think he's gonna live 30 years, not 20. Let me uh, ask you a quick question. Let me ask you a quick question. All right, question. that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah, well, you did an amazing job and anybody out there, I'll tell you what, if you have a single question concerning prostate cancer, share this with your friends. Because now you, you did one of the most detailed explanations of, of going through this. But you see the question, we jumped ahead and we went to the oncologist. And you just gave us everything on the oncologist. Talk a little bit about this patient being in your office. You're the primary care physician. You just got this testing back. What, you're working with a urologist. Yeah. And why, and he, he explained it, but from you, why does this uh, primary care physician say, well, I'm going to give you this choice? So what, so I, what I, happened here right. before we got to this explanation Dr. Whaley gave us? So I go through two mental exercises in general, and they're both diametrically opposed. Number four, the first thing is, if I'm going, if I'm thinking about doing a test, the first thing I ask is, is the result of that test going to change my therapy? And if the result is not going to change my therapy, I shouldn't be asking for the test. I'm wasting time and money. Okay. On the other side, if I've got somebody with an unknown, I will push for them to get fully informed. What are all of the options here? What are all the possibilities? And in this age group with that diagnosis or an elevated PSA, I am going to suggest they either see an, a regular oncologist or a urological oncologist to get fully informed about what are all the options that Bill just went through. Because as you can see, it's a fairly complex group of options. And this person needs to sleep at night knowing they made the best decision. But it is their decision. I just want them informed. So they're going to go see the oncologist in my book. Okay. You got it? Okay. Yeah, no, I just, I, I just think, I, I, I uh, thank you from Chicago for the question, but uh, it was one of those I was just really glad to have the connection from the primary care physician, the urologist, in the way you explained well, what it. What I said was the first thing he did was write, he went to the, pop, pop, the I, he doesn't say this, but I, I see what I see here is because his PSA was below 10. I didn't. I didn't Let me, can I ask the audience a question? Yeah, sure. Does it show on my face during these segments that I'm always concerned afterwards there's going to be a test? <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Whaley, question too. I was getting nervous. I read, is this going to be on the test? As I read this, te this, this question, I think this guy had an elevated PSA in his PCP's office, got sent to the urologist, got the biopsy, got the advice, and went back and said, here's what he recommends. What do you suggest? Because he, he, he got biopsied, and then his PCP asked him. So he had to go back. 
if he wanted to see a medical oncologist radiation therapist. I'm sure the PCP told him there are various options. Would you like to pursue them? That's exactly right. what I think he did. Okay. This question here came from Charlotte, North Carolina, and it came to me. It did not come through BCP. It came to me. It's a long story, but anyway. My father is a healthy 70-year-old man. If you consider a myeloma patient on treatment in chemical clinical remission, whatever that is. So here's a patient we talked about a few weeks ago who doesn't have anything wrong with him that had a monoclonal gammopathy that progressed to myeloma, has been treated with, with myeloma treatment, and is a complete remission. He did, I'll go forward. He didn't have a stem cell transplant because it says so. He has been taking low dose Revlimid, remember? That's what we said, just take a pill and you do good for years. But now has a return of a low amount of protein in his blood only. So that means that it's not in his urine, he's not in renal failure. What are his options? Should he consider stem cell transplantation? He declined it when he was first treated and went into remission. Did they give his age? 70. Okay. Now, and he's healthy, except for this. So there's, we have a lot of these. They don't have any other problems. They don't have hypertension, diabetes, or maybe have hypertension or cholesterol well treated, but they have no complications of it. And I see patients like this every day. And this is a question that I'm asked more than once every week. What do you do in this situation? Well, we've talked a lot about myeloma, and we've talked about stem cell transplant for people that are in remission who are relatively young to extend the length of their treatment program. So let's go to work on myeloma. Got the first one up there? So the basic question that we're being asked here is what's the best treatment for multiple myeloma? You'll remember that multiple myeloma is a disease. Normal plasma cells make antibodies. For some reason, ab plasma cells take off making an abnormal protein. Now, you can pull that down. Most of the ones we see are making this protein in an amount that is not myeloma, but called mugus. Oh, uh, mugus. Well, it'll go on by my And I, I keep mugus. saying that if you Sorry. got 88,000 people in the Falcon... Falcon Stadium and all are over age 50, 4,400 have muggers. Right. And now they don't have myeloma. So go to the next one. So the difference between muggers and myeloma is here you got a normal bone, you got a healthy bone marrow, you got a normal number of plasma cells. Pull that down. And that, when you go through them then and start looking, the only thing abnormal is the protein amount. So if you do a bone marrow, there's less than 5% plasma cells, and the only marker you've got is a protein in the blood, urine, or both. So now we're going into a very lengthy two-page algorithm. algorithm. There yeah, you that's, go. That's, All right, John. That's, that's going to require a third Alg set of glasses. It's a good <laughs> Algorithm for the evaluation of suspected, suspected. clonal plasma cell right. disorder. Okay, well, M Mugus is going to be over on one side. Myeloma is going to be on the other. And if, if we don't need to go through all of it. That's complicated. You don't. Can, can we back up here for a minute, yeah, Bill? Pull so, that one so down. So your regular patients coming in or they've gotten an exam or some, somehow they've had a lab done. And most, they of these come, most of these come from you, from, from PCP. Yeah, from care. So they have protein in their urine or they have some abnormal protein in their blood and, and somebody's done the additional testing to see is it monoclonal, is it of one spike. That's found, they go to the oncologist. The oncologist says we're going to do a bone marrow. 5% of your patients over the age of 60 will have this. Mm -hmm. And they'll go and get their routine physical. The biochemical profile that they do will not show kidney failure. It will not show high calcium things you'd see with myeloma. It'll show an elevation in globulin, and that's the only abnormality there. And then the PCP will order a serum protein electrophoresis, and it'll come back saying there is an M spike of IgA, Ig, I mean immunoglobulin, one A, B, or C, A, it's I, A, G, or M, 
And then immediately he says, go downstairs and see Dr. Whaley. And then we begin that algorithm. Now, another way it can present is the guy goes to the ER because he's got a pain in his jaw. Get the next one up there. Or he slips and falls in the bathroom and they go to the ER and they x-ray his head and you don't have to be a radiologist to see that it looks like there's holes in that skull. Or he has a, he has a low energy impact and breaks a bone for well, no he, good reason. He probably didn't yeah. even break a bone. I mean, most of these do not have symptoms. Yeah. This picture is made because of something else. Pull it down. These little lytic lesions within the brain, within the skull, almost all the time have no symptoms. And it's incidentally noted a dentist might be taking jaw x-ray and see that on his little screen. They don't even take x-rays anymore, do they? they? They show it on a screen. We went through this a few weeks ago. If you see this, got the next one, that's busted bones everywhere. And you will see these. We had a guy that had come to the local emergency room here and had a fracture in his arm. So it can present myeloma can present as a pathological fracture. Yeah, that, and I, that's what I want to emphasize here. A pathological fracture is, it's a, it, there's not enough energy of trauma in the event to account for the fracture, okay? So we call that a pathological fracture. Somebody knocks their hand on the, on the couch or the table and they got a broken wrist, that's a pathological fracture. That shouldn't have broken there. Or, or they're, they're stressing on something and they break a bone. Yeah, a break in a rib by coughing. So then you go, you go looking for other lesions. Other looks like a rat's been chewing on their bones. So. Now the other thing now is when you send a, somebody for a bone density study yeah. and they have kind of much worse osteoporosis than they ought to have a 60-year-old woman who's been in menopause eight years or a man whose testosterone's normal and had been taking steroids and they got pretty bad osteoporosis. So, you remember I always talked about Sally Fields and her TV ads for the pill they used to give. For right. Everybody remembers her. So let's go to the next one. You don't read, you don't read this word here? No, I won't make you. Osteoclast inhibitors for multiple myeloma. You do this on purpose, right? I do that, Osteoclast. Yeah. Osteoclast. Okay, this is, that's a Sally Fields drug, okay? You'll remember that I've told you before that through that Sally Fields drug, we learned that if a woman taking osteoporosis medication got an improvement in the bone, strengthening the bone made it less able to support the growth of the breast cancer, lung cancer, or other cell. And now we have injectable forms that are much more effective. But in myeloma, where you would have that in your skull, or a pathological fracture, or significant osteoporosis, you guys say newly diagnosed myeloma, have bone lesions, no bone lesions, blah, 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 blah. So no osteoclast or osteo, you work your way through this, take that down now. Many of these people will be taking an osteoporosis drug even though they may not be taking a myeloma specific chemotherapeutic drug. So, now this one here is going to be easy for you. What does that say? We're management of smoldering smoldering multiple myeloma. Uh -huh. Okay, so you got mugus, monoclonal gammopathy of uncertain significance, that progresses to a point where it no longer is uncertain significance. It's myeloma by virtue of more than ten percent, five or ten percent myeloma cells in a bone marrow, or a little bit of anemia or some other thing that takes it out of the category of uncertain significance where everything else is normal. So if you've got more than three grams of protein, greater than 10% cells in the bone marrow, or you got two or three of these things, now you will come to the point where you still don't have to treat. You know, down this algorithm, management of smoldering myeloma at the bottom on the right-hand side Close observation without treatment. Over here on this side, you're starting treatment. Pull that down. So now we're talking about what has happened to this guy. So we know that he was treated and he went into a remission. So now, initial treatment of multiple myeloma, you work your way through here, 
you go through the treatment. He's on Revlimid. So he got to this point right here where he was on Revlimid. But when you get to the point where he is in this remission, the very first thing that is recommended, this is stem cell transplant. What does that say? Preferred. Yes. You remember the preferred? Okay, the treatment with the drugs over here in Revlimid is an acceptable treatment, but it does not, it is not the preferred treatment. Why? Pull that down again. Now, why would it be, why would stem cell transplant be preferred over taking a pill to maintain, like athlete's foot or dandruff, to maintain it below? This is the natural history of modern day multiple myeloma. Over here, you got the left hand side, you've got the protein, you've got the induction treatment, you've got the consolidation treatment, you've got maintenance treatment, and this is time, but somewhere between two and five years, that's a recurrence. And then you've got the second line treatment here. And then in a little shorter period of time, right? It recurs again, and that's third line treatment there, recurs again. We have five or six lines, pull that down, of effective treatments for multiple myeloma, not that don't include transplant. That's, that slide right there, if you are transplanted, you have a good half or more more chance that none of those recurrences are going to occur. And that's why a stem cell transplant is preferred to maintenance because if you've got a, life, a lifetime it's going to be 10 or 12 years, you will relapse several times in that 10 to 12 years and if you're transplanted, you've got at least a 50% chance you won't relapse at all. So transplants now are done on people up to the age of 80 or longer if their mamas will live to 90 or they got no other diseases. So, let's pull out this next one. This patient is in his first relapse. So, the preferred treatment, got the next one. Selection of myeloma therapy for first or second relapse. When you start going through this thing again, you got chemotherapy to get you into remission, and then you've got stem cell transplant again as a recommendation you can pull that down and you've got various other forms of maintenance that you can give and so he can at this point decide to take a little more aggressive therapy push that protein down he really doesn't have to do anything he can wait three months and see if it's going up very fast so his first option is to keep on the revlimid and raise, probably raise the dose of Revlimid. Generally, you take Revlimid three weeks on or one week off, or you take it every day, and you take the lowest dose that'll keep him in remission, so you don't say anything about dose. It may very well be he can just raise the dose, or he could take it every day instead of three weeks on and one week off. That raises the dose intensity. It may put him back into remission, so that's choice number one. Choice number two is if he's a maximum tolerated dose, wait another three months and see what the pace of change is likely to be. And then you'll know whether or not you're forced into doing anything. Then if he elects to do something or you need to do something, there are various regimens there that are going to put him back into remission most of the time. And then he has to go through that decision again about maintenance versus stem cell transplant stem cell transplant then will be the preferred treatment. And even people who get stem cell transplants or who go through two or three of these can relapse. Well, at that point, you know, you used to say, wow, that's, that's a bad thing. But da -da -da -da, last one, you remember we've talked about CAR T therapy? What's the response rate? 100% overall response rate. What's the complete response rate? 50%. Pull that down. I don't know of anything except uh, penicillin shot for strep throat uh, that's got a 100% response rate. So that CAR T therapy costs a couple hundred thousand dollars. It is extremely effective for lymphoma and other diseases. And your dad being in good health, he's got a long survival in front of him. 
if he continues to stay under good care. And so you ask here, what are his options? Uh, basically, he's got tons of them. But after he's put back in remission, assuming he's treated, he's got to go through that stem cell transplant decision again. At Northside, the stem cell transplant success rate, the, the death rate is less than with cardiac bypass. I think it's one half of one percent or something. And it's a safe procedure. You got a bad three weeks when you do it. But I would say you probably ought to get in remission and then get some transplant. Stem cell transplant is uh, not an easy road, though. No, but it's two or three weeks and it's yeah, over with. Yeah. I mean, as I say, we, 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 we be, well, we're they're, they're very the bloody prostate. Honest. We're talking about the bloody prostate surgery you don't really see on the cartoon. All right. Well, Stay. now, we got, we, yeah, we got a few minutes here. How many deaths from COVID? Zero. Been 175 now for seven or eight weeks at it. How many cases this week? Six. Uh, that's baloney because I've had five of them in my my own staff in the last four weeks. They, we got enough COVID out there that make that I think is about as much as the flu. Yeah. And um, there was an article in the paper yesterday that soon as they take Paxlovid off the federal support uh, thing, and that's January one, nobody in the world will be able to afford Paxlovid because right now you get it free, right? It's a free drug. Well, it's gonna be, you know, $10,000 for, I don't know what it's gonna be, it might be $500, but it's okay. gonna cost something. It's gonna cost a lot of money, but Paxlovid has a, a ton of uh, cross reactions with other medications. Well, I don't, I don't very think it with. does a whole lot of and good. It doesn't do a whole lot of good and you can relapse. And there's no reason to be using well, it as far I, as that, I that was my point. It's yeah. gonna be very expensive and not yeah. any real big overwhelming reason why. It's, it's not like a, CAR T therapy that's worth every dime. All right, so Ray and I have been discussing the, the news out there, and we, we got some strong opinions about it. I, I want to go first to that one. Ohio measles outbreak sickens nearly 60 children. Yeah, all in two weeks. So people have become adverse to, to immunizations even before this business with COVID came up because Jane is of the opinion that if you get near near a, a immunization, you, your children are going to end up with autism and things, and we're not going to get into that. But there have been a lot of people who have been been uh, immunization adverse before this business with COVID came out, and I have clearly and repeatedly said that when Medicare started women died at 62 and men died at 57 so people didn't click collect medicare and women now are living to about 85 and men to about 79 and that's because of mammography colonoscopy and immunizations and ray and i both believe that your children ought to get their measles mumps chicken pox the standard immunizations that you give kids up through high school and i've even come i was a drug kicking and screaming to the hpv one because i've talked about hpv related cancers three times in the last six weeks so i think these and a lot of these measles outbreaks are in um are in uh very religious jewish communities or other religious communities that don't take them this one in ohio is not in a religious community or a mennonite community it is in the community so anyway we would encourage you to take the standard immunizations for children in school and not go chicken little on yourself about the autism well, i i want to do a little bit deeper dive in this because <clears throat> I have this thing about uh, people who are truth seekers or, or people who, who are committed to telling the truth. And the core of a physician relationship with a patient is has to be a, a truthful relationship. Uh, you're going to that person for critical information and you're sharing with them uh, all kinds of vulnerable, uh, important stuff. And, and there's no way in the world that you need to be in a room with somebody that you think is lying to you and you're going to share that kind of information or you're going to ask for advice. So the, the doctor-patient relationship is sanctified to the level of its truthfulness. We've had two years of high-level institutional lying in the medical profession. Lying. Lying. Yes. Okay. 
and it has destroyed and demolished well, the, you could the say, Russians. Well, you could say inadequate uh, frankness. How about that? No, I, no, I want to call it out. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to call it. I mean, call it live. Okay, okay, go ahead. Positions are, are in, listen, I'm not, I, I'm on one extreme of this, okay? I'm, a, I'm pretty harsh about this, and a lot of my peers are like, well, they just didn't know. Well, they should have known. Okay, the, um, w when Fauci's interviewed on under oath, and he's asked, well, what, uh, based upon what scientific study did you decide to use mask or recommend mask? And he says, well, there are none. But he did never say that until he was under oath. We dealt okay? with so much That's, unknown, yeah, but they, they made recommendations for things they didn't know. They didn't know, but they act like they knew, and more importantly, they should have known. Okay, so he doesn't get a pass on that. He lied about it, he should have known, and he should have been honest. He should have come out and said, well, we don't know. I think this may help. Okay, but he didn't. He said, these help, you got to wear these, and if you don't wear it, you need to be not on a bus, not on a plane, and you need to lose your job, and you need to be criticized, and you need to be all kinds of bad things, okay? It was a lie, and it's an institutional lie at the highest level, okay? That has affected Bill and Mai's profession, okay? So now you have people saying, well, what about the other vaccines? They lied about this vaccine. What about all these other vaccines? No, that, that, How in the world can I trust right. these? These people lie. How can I trust them anymore? So you got to go back to your physician and say, well, you and I have a trusting relationship. What do you think? And ignore all these institutional level people who now have demonstrated that they lie and they can lie and they will lie. Okay? And But we have a major thing to go on in this country where we have to get back to telling the truth is a critical thing at all levels of life and when you're put into the position where you are responsible for thousands and millions of people it's an absolute you don't get a pass on that and if you're caught lying you're out of there you're shamed and you're out of there you're gone you don't get the re retirement you don't get the attaboys the pat on the back or yeah well you tried no you lied you're out of there next can I ask? Oh, yeah. I know we have to get out. Well, I yeah, yeah, but, but, but remember, we got we, we the, the the ICUs for children under the age of two or three are full of respiratory syncytial virus patients now. That I said last week, if those kids had been around other children, eating their pounded dirt and doing Playing everything the else, they yeah. would have had. A exposure case. Yeah. before, and that's just one of hundreds of things. They didn't get immunized against R RSV. There's no RSV vaccine, but they got immunized by playing with kids in daycare and at church and we in were, the mud. We were right here. Turn. Go. We were here at Circuit World the very first week that this outbreak happened, and we started analyzing it together. The three of us started analyzing this together right. on this couch. March 29th. We know the first strain. We know what happened. Okay, so here's where we're at. You show the number every week. Now, I, I don't think I've said this. I hope, I don't, I don't think you'll mind. I, I think it was about six weeks you came in and you sat over there and you and I sat this close together and uh, you didn't look, you, you didn't look so well. <laughs> yeah. Was it your best day? <laughs> right. And you text me later, and what did you say? I said, I, I have uh, turned positive for COVID. Okay. So so you text me later, because it was the right thing to do. Yeah. I text Diane, hey, you know, Dr. Tidman was sitting there with us. He's tested positive. Nothing. I got nothing. Right. Okay? We were this close, 40 minutes. Right. Then, the other day, wasn't just the other day. It's not been a while ago, but the other day, I had a meeting at my office. We are this close with someone for an hour. They texted me the next day and said, uh, just to let you know, I tested positive. Okay? So yesterday, it's, yesterday I texted the individual and said, how are you? I hope you're well. I feel great. And the individual said, really nothing, just maybe a cold. But what, what's interesting is my spouse got nothing. Okay? So there's a lot of this that just doesn't have logic. But for me, outside looking in, all the ways they told me to protect myself. They don't work, okay? It's you know, all, it's all per Let me use the word shit. You understand the shit. Have you had your antibodies tested? I mentioned that to no. you a few weeks ago. You ought to go see your 
PCP and get COVID antibodies. You may well find you've got COVID antibodies and never even knew you Well, I do sick. have a Superman T-shirt I but, wear from but, time to time. And you do have your lumberjack shirt on, So, and you're a lumberjack and you're okay. But in the meantime, you're bringing up an important, my teaching point right now is COVID is out there, it is endemic, it is going right. to be varying, it's going to change, okay? You get symptoms, get yourself tested, right. okay? Because early treatment can get rid of it quick. Okay, mm -hmm. that's the only reason to get tested is because if you're positive and you start having symptoms, you can get early treatment and it can be gone in a day or two. And if you are positive and you are around someone, as I was with you on the studio that day, you tell them. Right, exactly. Right? Then if they get symptoms, they know what to do. So this is kind of sharing information. But that's how an endemic disease needs to be treated now. Okay? Because we can understand and we can get a test and we can get rapidly treated and we just stay informed. Instead of living in fear, thinking that a silly little paper mask does anything, thinking that you can have COVID and go out with a paper mask and you're not exposing people is BS. Yeah, that's okay? a joke. <laughs> that's a joke. Okay. I, and I, when I see people wearing a mask now, I'm, I want to ask them, are you sick? Because if you're sick, I don't want to be around you. Mask when or no me, mask. When people call me and say, I think I have COVID, I say, I don't bring them in the office. I say, go get a test or get a home test and then call me. I will treat you on a home test and then I will see you later. But I don't want you coming to my office, filling my waiting room full of sickness. But I certainly don't want you coming in wearing a mask because you had COVID and you know you have COVID and now you're sitting there breathing it all over people. The way to control this disease is to be educated and informed and to hunker down and get treated rapidly when you have it and get over it. Folks, as you well know, we have a great discussion and that's what I enjoy so much is our discussion that we have. And we thank Georgia Cancer Specialist, Northside Hospital Cancer Institute for this great discussion. You're late for work? Call my nurse and tell her it ain't my fault. All right, you are late for work. You okay. gotta get out of here, all-star panel right after this.